Welcome to the Pod of Asclepius, your fortnightly healthcare technology podcast for the technical crowd. Sponsored by the American Statistical Association, we're bringing the technical experts of engineering, entrepreneurship, data science and regulation straight to your earbuds. No fluff, no sale pitches, just important technical ideas described well to keep you up to date. All in the time it takes to get to work. And here's your host, Glenn Wright Colopy. Hey folks, welcome back to the show. As you know, January and February is the time of the year that many of the ASA sections are announcing their student paper winners. And while I can't invite this year's winners, because I don't know who they are, it's always fun to invite on our previous champions of the written word to find out what they did, what they're doing now, and what's in their secret sauce. And today, we've got a good one. Alison Meisner from John Hopkins. Methodologically, she's working on some really interesting areas in prognostic modeling from biomarkers. Applicationally, she works in areas from prostate cancer to kidney injury. So her topic should be of interest to a lot of listeners. And with that, Allison, welcome to the show. Let's get started. Thank you. So why don't you first tell the listeners just a little bit about yourself and your research? Sure. So I'm currently a postdoc at Johns Hopkins in the Department of Biostatistics. I got my PhD from the University of Washington a couple of years ago, and much of my dissertation research focused on methods for combining biomarkers in the context of risk prediction. So that could be diagnosis, prognosis, or screening. And now as a postdoc, actually a lot of my work has transitioned from sort of traditional biomarkers measured in blood and urine to genetic markers. And so much of my work now focuses on a particular type of combination called a polygenic risk score, basically just a combination of a bunch of genetic variants. So I'm really using what I learned before for combining sort of more standard biomarkers measured in blood and urine to now combining genetic markers, but still within the context of risk prediction, as I mentioned, diagnosis, prognosis, and screening. Cool. Yeah, when I was scanning through the list of uh, paper champions, I was really excited by your work uh, when I did my homework on you because I saw you're doing a lot of stuff, for example, in kidney illnesses, uh, which yes. is of personal interest to me. Oh, interesting. Yeah, so actually all my dissertation work was motivated by my involvement with a study on acute kidney injury after cardiac surgery. So there was this really large study that is actually ongoing looking at patients undergoing cardiac surgery and then who among them develops kidney injury after their cardiac surgery. And so the idea of that study was to measure biomarkers both before and right after surgery to perhaps provide an earlier diagnosis of kidney injury. So yeah, I I worked on that data set for five or six years. So it's a very rich data set. Well, that's really cool. And was your award-winning student paper, that was in your kidney research as well, right? Yeah, so it was this, the paper that I wrote that was submitted for that award was one of my dissertation papers. So I actually had, yeah, four different projects that were in my dissertation, and three of them were very strongly linked to the kidney injury data set. This one actually is the one that's sort of most loosely linked to that data set. This sort of came off of the other research that I had done for the kidney data set. And just to clarify to the audience who are less familiar with cardiac illness and renal diseases, what is the connection, sort of the causal mechanism that you're looking for with these cardiac surgery patients and acute kidney injury? What is the connection between those and why are we especially looking at that area? Yeah, so that's a great question. Many cardiac surgeries, but not all, is that patients go on what's called a cardiopulmonary bypass machine. And so what that entails is you're having a machine pump your blood for you. And so then what happens is when the surgery is finished and you're transitioned off of that machine and your basically body is sort of rebooting, you can incur kidney injury at that point in time. And why do we care about kidney injury for people not familiar with it, for people in the area of, for example, chronic diseases, when you hear kidney injury, kidney illness, it's, ooh, got to keep an eye on that. Right. What are the issues that you're looking at? What is the long-term ramifications of this uh, illness? Yeah, so much of kidney injury is sort of transient, so it will resolve within a few weeks to a few months, but for many people, it's not. So for a good proportion of people, they will end up going on to experience chronic kidney disease. Many of them go on to experience or have to undergo dialysis. There's increased mortality just from kidney injury, so it has many long potential downstream consequences that are more serious than just, you know, kidney injury sounds like if you just rest for a while, it will will sort of fix itself. And so for a lot of people that happens, but for many other people, there are very serious downstream consequences. Well, as someone who works in the area of patient vital sign monitoring, patients on, for example, dialysis units, 
create very interesting data sets. Um, you know, they have these nice longitudinal elements to it, rich time series that you can see again and again, which creates mm -hmm. very nice, you know, scientific data sets for risk prediction and adverse mm -hmm. event prediction. But of course, we would rather them not be patients who need dialysis in the first right. place. These patients who have this acute kidney injury, they are at much higher risk of having these long-term chronic illnesses as well. That's correct. Yeah. So a certain proportion of people with kidney injury will go on to require dialysis, which, as you mentioned, is, you know, very serious from multiple perspectives for the, you know, their health consequences that come simply from having kidney disease that requires dialysis. And then there's the sort of inconvenience for the patients of having to get dialysis every couple of days. And then there's the cost incurred to the healthcare system. So it's, you know, we're needing dialysis, even though it's advanced to the point where people can live for many years on dialysis, it's certainly not an ideal situation for anybody. Yeah. And just to clarify one example of these sort of comorbidities that come with kidney disease, when your kidneys fail to function and your body isn't processing the liquids out of your body, you have these patients who are gaining weight because essentially they aren't urinating out. Sure. Yeah. So the cardiovascular challenge to that, meaning that your body has to simply deal being heavier. It's mm -hmm. like having this weight gain. And then when every, say, three days out of the week, you're having this rapid loss in weight due to essentially being further dehydrated, in fact, mm -hmm. being dehydrated below probably what's the healthier level because you need to make sure you, there's enough time to get you to the next dialysis appointment, that essentially it's sending your body for a loop every, you know, Absolutely. every other day. And yes. that, yeah, you're sort of being knocked out of your homeostasis every couple of days. Sort of your whole body systems are all sort of being affected by that. So yeah, dialysis is relatively common and relatively routine at this point, but it's still a serious sort of undertaking. And what are the biomarkers that you're looking at? So you've mentioned that you're creating both diagnostic and prognostic models. You're using biomarkers. What are the explicit things that you're trying to either have prognoses for or to diagnose? And then also which physical elements actually inform those predictions? So that's a great question. So the biomarkers that were, the study that we, that we worked on, I should mention, is called TRIBE, Translational Research Investigating Biomarker Endpoints. And so what they did is measure a couple dozen biomarkers. They've measured a lot more since then, but when I worked on the study, it was a couple dozen biomarkers and it was cardiac bio, it was like, you know, sort of several categories of biomarkers, cardiac biomarkers, biomarkers of inflammation, and then biomarker of kidney injury. And so for prognosis, looking at biomarkers measured prior to the surgery, those biomarkers are intended more to pick up sort of general unwellness. So people who maybe are predisposed to have kidney injury, maybe people who are sort of have more severe cardiac issues, people who are more prone to inflammation, those types of people are maybe more likely a priori to have kidney injury. And then after the surgery, you know, again, looking at sort of inflammation markers, cardiac markers, and then specific measures of kidney injury that have been identified. And so those are basically trying to take stock of what's going on in your body at that point in time, and hopefully providing an immediate or relatively quick diagnosis of acute kidney injury, as opposed to what happens now, which is where you wait for a couple of days, you see if their serum creatinine increases over their preoperative level, and then you would call that acute kidney injury. So it takes a couple of days to diagnose, whereas what they're trying to do with the biomarkers measured right after surgery is to provide that earlier diagnosis based upon, is your body going crazy with inflammation? Are you having a really huge cardiac response? Are these kidney injury biomarkers indicating that you have kidney injury or that you're undergoing kidney injury? Sort of two differences there. And then I'll also say that in addition to the biomarkers, particularly preoperatively, you know, there are general indicators of health that are used to predict who might have kidney injury, things like BMI, age, sex, you know, the standard things that are maybe indicate somebody's underlying health state. And then another big predictor for the early diagnosis is how long you were on that, that machine that I mentioned earlier, the cardiopulmonary bypass machine, how long you were on that. So the longer you're on that, the likely you are to have kidney injury. So we really look at a combination, both of these blood and urine biomarkers, and then a few really important clinical variables. So just out of curiosity, if you have identified through one of your models or whatever the current clinical practice is that a patient has a predisposition to kidney injury, mm -hmm. will that actually, will a doctor proactively change the patient's clinical pathway to address that risk or to mitigate the risk? Or is it simply we're now informed and we hope for the best? 
Yeah, so it's both. So they can do things like try to minimize the amount of time they're on the cardiopulmonary bypass machine. They can do things like administer more fluids. The really big thing is that there's currently not great therapy for acute kidney injury. And so one of the issues is that it's really hard to enroll people in a trial because you don't know who's going to develop kidney injury. And some people, you know, might seem like they're relatively healthy and they might develop kidney injury and other people who are unhealthy might not. So it's very hard. And so one thing that is currently being proposed is if we have a good preoperative indicator of someone's likelihood of developing kidney injury, we could enroll those individuals or over-enroll those individuals in a clinical trial so that we would have a high enough event rate in our clinical trial so that we could actually see an effect of some proposed therapy. So not only will these biomarkers potentially be used for determining somebody's likelihood of having or developing kidney injury, but they'll also potentially be used for enrolling individuals in a clinical trial for kidney injury therapy. Well, that's really interesting. So the idea behind this isn't so much that we might want to use these biomarkers to essentially assuage a patient's fears that they might have an injury, but instead, mm -hmm. for example, as statisticians, if we're looking to power a clinical trial and we need to know that we have, have an event rate high enough that we can mm -hmm. actually have power to our clinical trial, we can use this to sort of screen in the most at-risk patients. Exactly. Um, yeah, it's, it's called um, prognostic enrichment. So yeah, so it's another use of these biomarkers. Great. And just out of curiosity, is there any element when you've identified that these patients are at high risk, is there any type of like medical ethics, I'm just curious, that requires you to inform them that they're of higher risk? Or is it simply we use it to stratify patients and then they get randomized as per usual? Yes, that's an interesting question. I do not know the ethical implications of that knowledge. I would imagine that it is it is shared and should be shared with the patients. And, you know, I would imagine that's all part of the sort of the informed consent for enrolling in the clinical trial, you know, we'll evaluate your risk for kidney injury prior to your operation. And then based upon that risk, we will enroll you or not enroll you in this clinical trial. And if you would like to be informed of that risk, we can tell you, I would imagine that that's all sort of rolled in. Cool. And when you're looking to develop these predictive and prognostic models, from your biomarker data, what are the technical challenges? Is it the veracity and the reliability of the biomarkers in measuring those biomarkers? Or are there also modeling challenges too? Or as in most clinical scenarios, it's all of these challenges? Yeah. So it's definitely both those challenges. We primarily concern ourselves with the challenges related to modeling, the more statistical side of things, I guess, although there are statistical elements to sort of, you know, how good your biomarker measurements are. But most of these biomarkers, you know, the assays for measuring them have been very well validated. And so that's not really something we think about too much. And we, meaning myself and my advisor, the other people in the study do think about those issues. But we primarily think about issues related to modeling, as I said, and that basically means, you know, the standard approach to developing a biomarker combination is to fit a logistic regression with all of your biomarkers in the model, and then you estimate it in association, an odd log odds ratio for each biomarker, and then you, and that's your biomarker combination. But there have been, there's been a push over the last, I would say, 15 years to focus more on what we're actually going to be using the biomarker. So in our context, we use these biomarker combinations for diagnosis, prognosis, screening, things where you want to um, generate a sort of predicted probability of somebody experiencing an event. And one could argue that optimizing a logistic likelihood is not really relevant to that goal. It's not really a measure that's connected to our biomarker combination's ability to predict the outcome. It's sort of more of a general measure. And so one thing that has been proposed is to use the area under the ROC curve. So for people that aren't familiar with that, it's basically just taking the true positive rate and the false positive rate for a given biomarker, the true positive rate being the proportion of cases or diseased individuals exceeding a certain threshold, the false positive rate being the same among controls. You plot that the true positive rate and false positive rate for every possible threshold you get the ROC curve, receiver operating characteristic curve, and then you take the area under that curve. And that tells you, or it's one measure, I should say, of overall predictive capacity. It's not a perfect measure. It has shortcomings that I won't get into, but it's very commonly used to evaluate biomarker combinations. So the thought was, 
if we're using the AUC to evaluate biomarkers and biomarker combinations, why don't we use the AUC to construct combinations? Because we want a combination that has a high AUC. So a lot of people have done a lot of work proposing methods for constructing combinations by maximizing the AUC, which is tricky in and of itself and has technical challenges in terms of that optimization and functions being amenable to optimization. So that's, so my work is related or my methodological work in this area is really related to ideas around constructing combinations by maximizing measures related to the ROC curve. Honestly, your work just sounds more and more interesting all the time. Just to clarify, traditional models that are trying to combine these biomarkers, for example, ones using logistic regression, the way that the logistic regression model is trained is obviously to maximize the likelihood of the model. And yeah. what you're saying is that for actual clinical application, optimizing the likelihood of the, with respect to the training data, isn't really sort of the end result that you really need to be working towards. So now you're taking measurements like, is it area under the curve with respect to your training data? Or is it more like you have this held out testing or validation set that you are optimizing with respect to? Yeah, so we optimize with respect to the training data, but then of course, when you want to figure out what the AUC of that combination actually is, then yes, you need to absolutely do that on independent data. I'm a really big fan of that, especially because as you know, when you likelihood is very nice, it's well behaved in circumstances. Other times, you know, it's a real jerk. But um, <laughs> some of our models, especially the more traditional models, had these well understood likelihood mm -hmm. and the inference that it revolves around those likelihood. But when you're trying to bring in more clinical knowledge and have these bespoke objective functions for your predictive models, mm -hmm. you don't have a lot of the assurances, the convergence assurances, the yeah. basic inference methods. And so you essentially have to scramble and sort of invent your own or, you know, roll your own inference methods sometimes. Mm -hmm. It actually reminds me a bit of the work that I was doing for creating personalized time series models for ICU patients. And oh. essentially, instead of trying to optimize the model with respect to the Mar log marginal likelihood for the patient's current data, what we're trying to do is select our parameters to show that retrospectively these models had very good predictive performance, so forecasting performance, which is mm. it's much harder to choose good parameters that forecast a time series well yes. when things are so volatile, whereas basically a lot of likelihood functions seem to work pretty well. So it's one of those things where you go from having a very straightforward problem when you're simply training a statistical model mm -hmm. to when you're trying to act, implement that clinical knowledge, you actually have this much more complex problem. Yes, absolutely. So by and large, logistic regression and other likelihood-based methods are, like you said, very well understood, very easy to implement. But if you do have some sort of measure in mind that you're interested in, like the AUC or some related measure, you will generally do better by directly optimizing that measure and to construct your combinations. And so it's not as simple as sort of saying to people, oh, I think we should do this. You also have to provide sort of the theory to make them feel like they're on sound theoretical footing. You have to provide a statistical package, like we have an R package so that people actually use this because it's just so easy to run logistic regression. So I think that these ideas of sort of direct maximization or direct optimization have merit, but there's, you know, work that goes along with that in order to get people to actually use them. On the issue of the different models, so if you look at a model more traditional way with respect to maximizing likelihood mm -hmm. versus the types of models that you are training with your bespoke optimi you know, bespoke objective functions, do you actually compare the models and see how much they diverge? Do they look very different in the end, or is it more of just a small tuning that has a big effect? So we compare in our simulations, and I'll talk about this later, but we, we compare our method to logistic regression. And I will say that logistic regression is very robust. So it's very hard to sort of break logistic regression. And that's not to say that there's not merit in pursuing a method like ours. We aren't putting this method out there and saying that our method will outperform logistic regression on every single data set. What we are saying is that there are scenarios where there is an improvement offered by our method over logistic regression. And that in the remaining scenarios, it performs comparably to logistic regression. So the idea is that there may be combination based on logistic regression and the combination based on our method may have similar performance in a lot of scenarios, but there are important scenarios in which our method offers a benefit. So to answer your question, in a lot of cases, they are very similar, but then in some important cases, they are, they are different. 
Well, this sounds dangerously close to one of my friend's favorite presentations. His name's Alistair Johnson. He's up at MIT, and he has his favorite presentation, which just says, logistic regression will outperform your fancy machine learning model by 3% always. Um, Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. And it is interesting, yet again, we're talking with experts like yourself, and we find there are these great many really interesting, more complex models, but these more simple, well-understood models still very much have a place, especially when you're trying to have some type of robust clinical inference. For sure. And it makes people more comfortable. So when you're developing a combination, you're trying to take it to your clinical collaborators, they all understand logistic regression. They, they're they familiar with it, they're comfortable with it. And so it, it's likely that you know that will maybe go over better with them than some fancier method. On the flip side, I've been in many situations with collaborators where they say, oh, logistic regression isn't performing very well. Can you use fancier machine learning method to, to get a combination that performs better? And I say, I can try, but I think at the end of the day, it's not the method. It's the data just doesn't support that strong of a relationship. And so I would completely agree with the assessment that, you know, all of these fancy machine learning methods, um, particularly in the context of prediction, which is very hard, maybe offer some very, very minor gains. And they're by and large, much more difficult to understand, much more difficult to implement. They require a bit of expertise to implement them correctly and then to interpret their results. And, you know, logistic regression is just sort of that old trusted standby. Yeah, it's really nice to hear yet again from someone who, frankly, has the courage to say, you know, that these more sophisticated models, they are very interesting, but ultimately their success and their ability to outperform more traditional models is really what can only pan out from the data and that exactly. it is dependent on having that strong either physical relationship or clinical relationship. There's strong clinical correlations between what you're trying to predict and what is predicting it. Absolutely. Um, and no model will get you out of simply predicting two entities that aren't sufficiently related. Exactly. Yeah, there's no one can make a fancy enough machine learning method that provides valid measures that actually will, you know, give you a something that's predictive if there's nothing, no connection there. Yeah. On the issue of clinical collaborators, I'm curious, do you work at all in trying to figure out how these different prognostic models change from site to site or center to center or clinic to clinic? That's a good question. By and large, the university or the centers that we have worked with through the tribe study are very large academic centers, and those tend to all be sort of on the same page with these sorts of things. You know, they read the literature and they're aware of sort of the latest methods and the best practices. And so they, and they're very, for the most part, willing to implement these new things. And so physicians and researchers at smaller institutions, you know, it's not to say that they're not aware of the latest and greatest, but they might not be, the at the institution level, might not be as quick to adopt sort of new practices if they're not sort of a research-based institution. So in that sense, I do think that there is probably some variability, but then you also have large bodies that come out and provide recommendations that sort of everyone's supposed to abide by. Once that happens, everyone sort of falls in line, but there's that sort of gray zone in between when something new is proposed and then when it's you know advocated by some big governing body, wherein you know different, different institutions may adopt something that's new and other institutions might not. And so that's certainly interesting to look at from sort of what they call implementation science point of view, you know, how much of a difference is, is a newer model or a new biomarker combination making in clinical practice, clinical outcomes, patient experiences, things like that. Well, Alison, that's really cool. We have a pretty good idea about what you're working on now, and I'm really interested to see more of the uh, technical side of what you're working on. Uh, you've really sold it to me. So then in part two of this episode, we'll come back and see the technical deep dive of Alison Meisner's work. Great. Thank you. Well, that's it for this episode of the Pod of Asclepius. We hope you enjoyed it and will tune in for our next episode. If you're watching from YouTube, don't forget to subscribe to our channel and leave a like. You can also follow us on our other social media channels, including LinkedIn, Twitter and Instagram. Have a great story or presentation that's ready for prime time? Or know someone who does? Drop Glenn an email because he'd be happy to hear from you. We would like to thank our sponsors from the American Statistical Association section on Statistical Learning and Data Science, section on Medical Devices and Diagnostics, and North Carolina Chapter. The views expressed on the show are those of the speaker and not their employers, our sponsors, or anyone else not saying the words.